attorneys. You can either take it or fight it if you want to. If you fight it, you're going to spend a ton of money, and at the end, you're not going to get any more than that anyway. So oftentimes, think about it. At the end of 18 months, you're counting on a pretty big commission. Oftentimes, agents were put in a position where they would end up having to negotiate their commission way down for this thing to our close and then to our get paid. I think North Carolina's the 28th or 29th state that ultimately passed an act like this. And basically what it said was, you know what? To give your commission a little more power, to give you agent a little more power as you're getting closer to closing, we're going to establish the ability of commercial agents to put a what? Lean on the property that they have sold, <coughs> that they have contracted on. So the Commercial Broker Lean Act, here's the only thing you're writing now, allows commercial agents the ability to place a lien on the property to protect their compensation. What's the purpose of this act? Bless you. To allow a commercial agent to put a lien on the property to protect their compensation. And you said that's when they're under contract. Yeah. That there, is, there is a timeline. We're not going to get too much into the timeline, but there is actually a timeline associated with this when you're under contract. And it comes up just before closing. To protect their compensation, yeah. Allows them to put a lien against their property, I'm sorry, against the property they sold to protect their compensation. Okay. That's all I really need you to remember. But what I'd like to introduce to you in this particular case is there is one other specific thing about this act that I think is worth knowing. The only one, the only agents that can do this would be the listing agent. The listing agent that's selling the property or the listing agent who is leasing the property. Remember, in commercial, it's not uncommon to have really large uh, listing, I mean, leasing commissions, okay? Now, the reason I want to mention that to you is I want you to put a couple of thoughts together on this. Why would this be only the listing agent that can do it and not a buyer's agent? Does anybody want to take a shot at why it's only listing agents? Because once you understand it, you don't really have to memorize it. It just makes sense. Who wants to take it on? Okay, you are going in the right direction. Here's the direction that she's uh, going in. And let me change your words to make it a little more straightforward. The listing agent is the one that has the contract with the seller, right? The listing agent is the one that has a contract with the owner of the property. The buyer's agent, they're going to get paid typically either from the buyer or from the listing agent. So the only reason listing or leasing agents can do this is they're the only ones that have a contract that says they're entitled to compensation from the owner who has the property that I'm going to put the lien on. So once you understand that, and do you understand that? Are you just saying that? Once you understand, there's no reason to go back in and not study it, okay? But that's a, uh, just another little fact for you about this. Commercial Broker Lean Act, you understand why it exists? Okay, I'm through talking about specific liens. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about um, general liens. General liens, let me get there. I skipped a few slides talking about mechanics liens, but you'll see it was the time frame that uh, we discussed in that. General liens, when we talk about general liens, this is another case where what I'm getting ready to say is probably not true, but it feels like it's true. General liens, I think of as being liens against persons other than properties, but, but that's not true. The reason I say that is, remember specific liens were tied to a particular property, right? What happens with general liens is they will follow you, they will follow you. You remember that judgment I was talking about a little bit earlier? That judgment will follow you, and you know what the happiest day in the life of one of your creditors is? If you get property. Because a general lien, importantly, can attach any property that you own in the county where the judgment is um, reported. A general lien can attach any property, not a specific property, any property, in the county where the judgment is reported. And notice I said where the judgment's reported, not just where it's won. The judgment may have been won in Wake County. You move to Charlotte, this can be recorded in Mecklenburg County, and I can attach property that you have there. Okay? General liens. 
What's interesting about this is every once in a while, I don't intentionally mean to pick up uh, questions that are on the exam, but every once in a while, I'll have a student that comes back and says, hey, listen, I missed this question on the exam, and I think you told me something wrong about that. Well, in some cases, that may be true. I don't mean to. But this guy comes back from the exam and he says, Chris, you told me that general liens did not attach property. I said, no, no, no. That's not what I said. I said general liens don't attach specific property. But general liens can attach any property that you own in the county where it's recorded. Okay? So be sharp about that. I don't think you're likely to get uh, difficult questions about this. When we talk about that judgment lien that I was mentioning earlier, that's a great example of a uh, general lien. Your state and federal tax liens. Now, this doesn't mean it's April 16th and you haven't paid your taxes. This means it's 2018 and you haven't paid your 2008 taxes. The IRS finally gets tired of it and they file a lien uh, against you. They file a judgment against you to collect their taxes. That's when they attach your property, okay? So, general liens, they work the uh, same way. Specific versus general liens. You feel okay about those? Constance, you feel okay about that? Okay. Yes. Think think about it at the uh, at the end of the county. Okay. So here's the deal. If I want a judgment against you, I am going to file a uh, lawsuit against you in whatever the county of record is going to be. But remember, even if once I want it, I can record it at the uh, register of deeds office in any county where you are. I file a judgment against you because you owe me money uh, for credit cards on a credit card company. And you're like, well, what are you going to do? I don't pay my credit cards. What are you going to do? It's just a signature of mine? So I'm going to go to court. I'm going to sue you. Once I win the judgment, I'm going to report it everywhere I think you are. Okay? That way I can attach you to the property. Okay. Uh, just kind of an FYI here. What, what's the effect on the lien? See if these words sound familiar to you. It, we were saying it's an appurtenant when it runs with the land. Technically, it's an encumbrance. Encumbrances run with the title uh, as well. That's why at closing, well, let me get you to visualize this for just a moment. Many of you have been through a closing before, and you understand how this works. If you were to buy my property today, if you were to buy my property uh, today, let's say I sell it to you for $200,000, and let's say I still owe my bank $125,000. My bank has a lien against the property, right? So visualize this. You're somehow going to bring $200,000 to the closing table. Maybe part of it would be your down payment money, okay? Part of it would be earnest money, which comes in from a trust account, all right? And then the bank wires money in on your behalf. Your bank wires money in for you to buy my house. So what the attorney does is collects all this money coming in from various sources into the attorney's trust account. And then the attorney's going to take that money, and the attorney works for you, the buyer. The attorney, don't, they don't want any liens to be on, the, on this property after we have closed. So what the attorney does is starts dispersing this money. The first thing that they're going to do is they're going to pay off my lien, okay? Because I'm selling the house, my bank no longer has a right to have a lien on the property. So before I, the seller, can put money in my pocket, the attorney takes that money, pays off my bank, that satisfies that lien. Does that make sense? Same thing happens if you have late taxes or homeowner's fees or something like that. The attorney takes that money, distributes it, because the last thing they want is some lien left over from me affecting you, their claim. That's a way of closing it. Lien does not attach to the owner, it attaches to the uh, property. We will revisit that a couple of times during our class. Lien priority, did we talk about lien priority just a moment ago? Yeah. Lien priority is established under what act that starts with the letter C? Connor. The Connor Act. There you go, you got it all there. Now, I told you when I started this chapter that all liens are encumbrances, and we spent a little bit of time talking about that. We're now moving on to there are some encumbrances that are not liens. These are all very important vocabulary words for you. Let's knock them out really quickly. Your deed restrictions are actually, your restrictive covenants are in fact, uh, are in fact an encumbrance on your property. Weirdly enough, sometimes on the test you will hear them referred to as restrictive covenants. Sometimes you hear them referred to as protective covenants. The ones in our neighborhood, I thought of them as being restrictive covenants 
when the HOA came around and told me I had to replace my mailbox because it had rust on it. And apparently you can't have any rusty mailboxes in our neighborhood. And apparently the only place you can get this mailbox is some place that sells them for 125 bucks and another $300 for installation. I'm not bitter, but I thought, I thought it was restrictive when they forced me to fix my uh, mailbox. But you know what? I thought it was protective when they made the guy down the street get rid of his car, which was up on blocks and had been sitting there leaking oil all over the uh, grass for months. Then I thought it was protective. Either way, it's a burden on title. Good, bad, or indifferent, it's an encumbrance on our property. Your restrictive covenants are. We will talk more about these extensively in Chapter 6. All I'm asking you right now is do you understand why they are an encumbrance? Technically, your restrictive covenants are an encumbrance and an appurtenance. They're good and bad. Make sense? Okay? Adding up the category word. Uh, category words. All right. One of my favorite words in real estate. This literally is a flashboard word. Okay? For years, I have taught this class. Okay, why are we flipping this? Is it the next slide that comes up? Okay. For years, I have taught this class, and I have always referred to this as a list pendants. And not too long ago, I went to a conference and I listened to an attorney talk about this. And the attorney referred to this as a lipendon. Well, the words lipendon are never coming out of my mouth again. So, for my way of saying it, this is a list pendants, is what it is. It doesn't matter. It's just Latin lingo to make us sound smarter than what we really are. What it really stands for is a notice of pending litigation. A list pendants is just simply a notice of pending litigation. There has been a lawsuit filed against this property, and if you have any interest in buying this property, you need to know. So the minute that the lawsuit was filed, the attorney filing the lawsuit also filed a list pendants. That way, anybody looking at this property knows that there's been a lawsuit filed against it. Can you buy a property? Can you buy a property that has a lawsuit pending against it? Sure. Sure, you can. Sure you can, but you're going to take the property subject to the outcome of the lawsuit. Does that make sense? All right. And a lot of the things we're talking about in regards to recordation is just to let the buyers know, let people that have an interest in the property know. Because once you know, you can make your own decision whether you're willing to take whatever risk is associated with the encumbrance. Feel okay about that? This pen is it's a level one vocabulary word for you. Do you understand how it's an encumbrance? Bang. You're done. Okay? All right, let's keep these level one as well. We're getting ready to talk about a, uh, we're getting ready to talk about writs, a writ of attachment. And on the next page, we're going to talk about it. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's all on the same page. A writ of execution. This is a process. These actually work very similar to the way a list pendants. It's basically the same thing as a list pendants. A writ of attachment. On, really, all I want you to understand here is the Timeline. A timeline. Rid of attachment. I am getting ready to file a lawsuit against you for not paying me some money. Like I was talking with Constance just a moment ago, she owes me money. I'm getting ready to file a lawsuit against her for, that ultimately I hope to win a judgment. On a writ of attachment, I will file a writ of attachment at the same time that I file the lawsuit. Notice the timeline here. I'm going to file in the courts on the register of deeds. I'm going to file a writ of attachment saying, if I win this judgment, I'm going to attach any property that she has in this area. Notice again, when did I file for a writ of attachment? Simultaneously with filing the uh, suit. Okay. Have I won the suit yet? No. But what I'm doing is I'm putting the notice out that I plan to attach this property if, in fact, I win this lawsuit. Okay. If I ultimately win the lawsuit, then I can file what's known as a writ of execution. The writ of execution says, hey, sure, go out there and take your property, sell it at public auction, and give me the money because she owes me money. So writ of execution, that is actually filing the suit where they go and claim the property and sell it. You're saying these lawsuits are anything at all, like how you were saying, a credit card debt is not yes. paid. It doesn't have to do with real estate. It's just 
It started off as something other than real estate, but you owing me money allows me to ultimately go after that money, and if you don't have the liquid assets, judgments allow me to attach your real property. So that's a great pickup to understand. This didn't start out with real property. Actually, I had a conversation with a guy one day. It was back during the meltdown, 2008, people losing their jobs, they, you know, they're struggling making their payments and that stuff. He had a lot of equity in his home, but the problem was he started creating a lot of credit card debt, and he finally got to the point where he said, screw it, I can't pay it. I am too far behind on my credit cards. I had not had a job for a period of a time. I can't pay it. What are they going to do? Take my house? Yeah. I said, yeah. yeah you got to be careful. Because what could happen here is if those credit card companies get mad enough at you to take you to court and collect. Now listen, if you send the credit cards uh, companies a little bit of money, they won't foreclose on you because obviously you're never getting your debt down, but at least you're sending them some money. But I'm talking about you quit paying them, they have no recourse but to eventually file a lawsuit against you. And if they choose to do it, they could attach your real property because of that. Rid of attachment. I'm filing a suit to go after you for a judgment. Rid of execution, I won the judgment and you're still not paying me, I'm now going to uh, ask the sheriff to go attach your property, sell it at public auction so I can get my money. Yeah. So for the rid of execution, is that something you actually file? Or is that just the action? It's an action. It's a, it's a process. You're filing a rid that actually tells the... Uh, uh, so the rid is, is a file. Well, now remember, the, the writ of attachment is not the lawsuit. No. The writ of attachment is a filing saying, I'm going to attach but this property. But then you file that, but the writ of execution is a legal action. Yes, a legal action where I'm sending the sheriff out to uh, get the property and sell it to public auction. Okay, more importantly, how are we doing on time? Okay, we're good. We're good on time. Go ahead and stop that for a minute, at least.